My name is Catherine. I'm a sonographer and I've been scanning various species for nine years now. I started with animals, but I went on to do my master's degree in human echocardiography. I now split my time between being a research sonographer at Imperial College and scanning small animals at a local vet practice. My aim is to give you a brief overview of echocardiography, and I'm going to stick mainly to the types of things you could see with any ultrasound machine. So if your practice doesn't have a dedicated echo machine or even a phased array probe, you can still assess the heart. The examples I show are going to be from small animals because these are my own images and I scan in a small animal practice, but the anatomy really isn't all that different between species. The prevalence of disease does vary and there are slight differences in the way the heart is positioned in the chest, but in echocardiography we are always aiming to obtain standard repeatable views on every animal. So even if you're an equine specialist, for example, I hope you will still find this useful. A phased array probe is designed to have a small, flat surface area to fit between tight spaces like ribs, and the beam then fans out using electronic beam steering. In a microconvex probe, the crystals are actually arranged in an arc, so they don't need to be steered to achieve that same pie shape. A phased array is generally a lot better for quantitative echocardiography, and particularly for the use of spectral Doppler measuring the velocity of blood to give you information about stenosis or intracardiac pressures, for example. For most vets, however, the priority is ruling out a pericardial effusion in a breathless pet, screening for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, HCM, in a cat prior to administering anaesthetic, for example, checking for mitral valve disease in a small dog, ruling out dilated cardiomyopathy, DCM, in a large dog. The things which are obvious so long as you know what you're looking for and don't necessarily need quantification when you're seeing an animal for the first time and your goal is simply to rule the pathology in or out at that moment. I'm going to recap each of those diseases and show you how they appear on ultrasound. But before I do, let's get familiar with normal. The first view I'd like to look at is the right parasternal long axis view. This view is the start of your examination and you can get a good idea of almost everything you want to know just from this one view. Here's an example from a dog. In a normal animal, the left ventricle should always be the largest and most muscular chamber in this view. So can you see the four chambers here? and that this must be the left ventricle here. The left and right ventricles are separated by the interventricular septum. In cats, it is not uncommon to have a septal bulge near the base here. But if the whole of the septum appears excessively thick, then this will alert you to the potential of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is something that you could easily measure on any machine if you wanted to the thickness of the posterior and the septal walls. Different papers and textbooks recommend slightly different cutoff points, but the most widely used is a wall thickness of six millimeters, with anything greater than nine millimeters indicating severe HCM. The right ventricle should always be about one third the size of the left in this view. If the right ventricle is ever as large or larger than the left ventricle in this view, this should alert you to a problem with the right heart, some kind of volume or pressure overload, which has caused it to dilate. I will show you examples of all of these things later, but for now, I want to get normal into our heads because that is what will enable you to quickly spot when things are abnormal. Blood flows into the left ventricle from the left atrium and through the mitral valve. You will want to pay particular attention to the mitral valve in smaller dogs. In spaniels, you can almost guarantee that it will be abnormal. It will just be a matter of how much. If you have a machine with colour Doppler capabilities, this will help a lot. But you should also get into the habit of inspecting the 2D image first. Are both leaflets thin? Do they move in a normal way? Do they close together during systole? And is that closure point in line with the mitral annulus? 
Those aren't easy questions to answer when you first begin, but if you scan enough hearts, your brain will quickly be able to distinguish an abnormal from a normal valve. There are other clues that can help you as well. This is the left atrium. And if an animal has significant long-standing mitral regurgitation, this chamber will be dilated. It dilates in other diseases too, namely any disease that affects diastolic function and raises left atrial pressures, such as HCM. I will show you a very popular view that is used to quickly assess the size of a left atrium, but before I do, while we're in this long axis position, I want to quickly show you how you can open up your left ventricular outflow tract and examine the aortic valve. This is the human heart, and you should be able to recognise all of the same features that you've seen already. I'm scanning a little unconventionally here. I've twisted my probe to approximate the type of view you'll get in a dog or a cat. You won't see the right atrium as obviously here as if this were a dog, but you can see the right ventricle and can hopefully appreciate that it is normal in size in relation to the left. You can see the interventricular septum and how the walls of the left ventricle all squeeze together nicely in systole. Now I'm going to twist my probe very slightly, and this is a tiny, tiny movement, even more so on a small dog or a cat. Can you see how another valve now pops into view? This valve is the aortic valve. You can also obtain this from the left side of the animal and get a little bit more of the aorta itself in view. And that would be very important if you were performing an in-depth investigation on a boxer, for example, whom you might suspect of having congenital aortic stenosis. But for now, just use this view to look at the outflow tract. Is it uniform in diameter, or does it come in like an hourglass, potentially causing some obstruction to flow? Do the valve leaflets open freely and widely, or are they restricted? And if you can see beyond the valve, as you often can in dogs from this view, again, have a look for any narrowing. The third view I'd like to show you is the short axis view. Again, you are not moving from place, you are simply rotating 90 degrees. That is why it's so important to perfect that first long axis view, because once you've found that window, you really do not need to move from it when you're performing a cardiac screen. That is easier said than done, and you probably will inadvertently move when you first attempt to twist. Everybody does, and everybody finds it frustrating. This is the short axis view at the level of the papillary muscles. From here, you can not only again see and measure wall thickness, but you also have an excellent view of left ventricular systolic function, of how well the walls are squeezing into the cavity. From this view, you can tilt towards the base of the heart to first catch the mitral valve and further to reach the aortic valve in cross section. You should try to see all three valve leaflets and when you are correctly on axis, you will see what you may have heard referred to as the Mercedes-Benz sign. This can be difficult with normal valves at fast heart rates. Because the leaflets are so thin, they can be tricky to see. But the good news is that if the valve is abnormal, and in dogs, this would invariably be in the form of a bicuspid valve, the leaflets will be more obvious. The most difficult thing about this view is making sure you really are cutting through the short axis precisely. Keep an eye on the aortic valve and make sure you can't see any of the left ventricular outflow tract. Here you can see it coming into the left because I haven't rotated far enough. And here now it will be coming in on the right because I've rotated too far. The short axis is a great view, not only for performing measurements of wall thickness and cavity size, but also for assessing systolic function. Now that you've seen what normal looks like, can you tell which of these dogs has impaired left ventricular systolic function? 
And can you see just by glancing at the scale down the side that the left ventricle for the dog on the left is very dilated? Even without knowing the breed, and in fact this was only a medium sized dog, but regardless, an approximately 8 centimetre diastolic diameter is significantly dilated for any dog. What about your long axis view? Can you tell which left ventricle is impaired here? Of course you can. You don't need to perform an ejection fraction to tell you that. Similarly for wall thickness, it's probably not difficult for you to appreciate now that this cat has very thickened heart walls. You can tell this without measuring. The cavity of the left ventricle is practically obliterated. Just glancing at the measurement markers, you can see that the walls are about one centimetre in thickness. Also, look at the way it is contracting. Perhaps a little more difficult to appreciate if you haven't seen a lot of echoes before, but to me it looks very stiff. HCM is primarily a disease of diastole. The thickened heart muscle is unable to relax properly, and diastolic dysfunction is one of the first signs of HCM. To assess it thoroughly, you would need to use your pulse wave and tissue dopplers, but if the disease was that subtle as to require that level of interrogation for diagnosis, it's probably not something you'd need to be concerned about unless you were going to specialise in cardiology. Here's an example from another cat, and this time we're looking at your first view, the right parasternal long axis. Again, although the systolic function appears good, the entire movement of the heart muscle just seems very stiff in comparison with a healthy heart. You also have other clues here, such as the size of the left atrium, almost as big as the ventricle, which, in the absence of significant mitral valve disease, is another sign of diastolic dysfunction, and in this case, HCM. Just as HCM is your prime suspect in cats, mitral valve disease will probably be your most common finding in dogs with murmurs. It has a strong genetic component and is more common in smaller breeds. Almost all King Charles Cavalier Spaniels will have it by age 10. The valve becomes thickened and myxomatous, usually affecting the anterior or septal leaflet, or both. Anterior leaflet is borrowed from human cardiology and surgeons will tell you that it is anatomically incorrect in canine patients and will prefer you to use the term septal leaflet. Septal is actually easier to remember because it's always the leaflet closest to the septum. You will see its counterpart referred to as either the posterior or the mural leaflet. In this example, the anterior leaflet is thickened and as it closes, part of the leaflet body prolapses back into the left atrium. This will result in regurgitation, the blood going back into the left atrium through a leaky mitral valve during systole, instead of all going out the aortic valve as it should. Again, you have other associated signs even before you cheat and turn on your colour Doppler. And most obviously, this is a dilated left atrium. In this case, the dilatation is due to the volume of blood that is being forced back into the atrium. Finally, I'm going to show you a couple of quick examples on effusions. Effusions can be pleural or pericardial, and it's important to distinguish the two. A pericardial effusion will be between the heart wall and the pericardium whereas a pleural effusion will be outside of the pericardium. I love this example because you've actually got both effusions here. This large one is pleural, and this hyperchoic line here is the pericardium, and then inside the pericardium you have another effusion between the heart wall and the pericardium itself. So in this example you have both pleural and pericardial effusions in one. This is a more typical example of a pleural effusion in a very unwell patient. You can see bits of lung there floating inside the effusion. It's not usually perfectly black like in the other example. This is a more common appearance of a pleural effusion. In this example, no obvious pericardial effusion here. And here's an example of a pericardial effusion 
you can see it surrounds the heart completely here and it's causing some problems for this animal. Do you see the right ventricular outflow tract at the top is starting to collapse from the effusion around it? This bright white line here, this is the pericardium. So you can see the effusion is enclosed within the pericardium here. In this final example, you can see again, we have a pericardial effusion, a little small one here and a large one at the top. But don't get so distracted by effusions that you don't notice anything else. Can you see this huge mass coming in and out of the tricuspid valve here in this dog? I'm just going to fly through effusions there because I have a whole presentation on this specific topic on the Animal Ultrasound Association website. You can also email me directly and I can answer any questions you may have. I hope this short presentation was a useful introduction to echocardiography and if you'd like to find out more please visit the Animal Ultrasound Association website or just get in touch with me directly. Thank you.